Some of your favourite clubs are in a perpetual debt cycle, specifically Man United, Barcelona, Olympic Lyonnais, Real Betis and Burnley. I know what some of you are thinking, who cares about Burnley? Hear me out. In an effort to be inclusive, I decided to mention them as well. With that being said, the perpetual debt cycle that many top tier football clubs find themselves in doesn't limit itself to the clubs mentioned. In fact, there are many more clubs in a situation which requires them to borrow from their futures to fund present day needs. This situation has occurred because some clubs have taken out loans so large that the only part of repayment is refinancing the debt with more debt, rescheduling the debt, so pushing out repayments, the sale of a club's best players, or an injection of cash from ownership, which in cases like Everton may no longer happen as the owner simply fed up. From the outside looking in, it may seem as though football clubs are highly lucrative businesses that shouldn't need debt funding. But unfortunately, this isn't the case. And this is because as revenues have increased, so have costs, in particular player wages and player acquisition costs. Now, to illustrate the extent to which clubs have increased their borrowing over the past few years, let's have a look at some graphs. In this video, we'll discuss how some European football clubs have gotten themselves into this mess and what the future holds. Now, for us to understand the football debt cycle, we must first understand football club finances. Football clubs typically generate income from four main sources, broadcasting, commercial, match day and player sales. Broadcasting income is earned from networks like Sky, BT and ESPN, all of which pay to broadcast games live on their networks. The Premier League's broadcasting deal is worth over £10 billion for the 2022 to 2025 cycle. Commercial income is earned through club sponsorships with brands and merchandise sold. A more recent phenomenon is clubs selling the naming rights of their stadiums. This is where a company pays a club a yearly fee in exchange for the club stadium bearing said company's name. For example, Spotify Camp Nou. How beautiful does that sound, right? Match day income is pretty straightforward. This is earned through tickets and concessions sold for games. Player sale profits, as the name indicates, relates to the profit earned from the sale of players. This line item tends to be the most volatile because player values tend to fluctuate with performance. Now, on the other hand, a club's main expenditures are player and staff wages, other operational expenses for putting on games and the day-to-day -day running of the training ground, other expenses which typically include agents fees, flights, hotel and hosting costs, amortization costs associated with player purchases, depreciation costs for physical assets and machinery, and finally, financing costs associated with borrowings. Now, on the funding side, a club would typically fund itself in three ways with shareholder money, debt funding and or business operating income. In an ideal world, a football club would be self-sufficient. That is to say that a club will be able to fund operating expenses with operating income without a need for continued shareholder capital and or debt financing. But unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. In the Premier League, you might finish one year in the top four, compete at the latter stages of the Champions League, perhaps even win the Champions League, and then a few years later, be a mediocre at best mid-table side. Just look at our friends over at Chelsea. Because of this harsh reality, it's extremely difficult to predict with certainty at what level revenues will be in an upcoming season. Now, let's take a step back. If you're a regular Champions League contender and finish in the top four positions of the Premier League, one can assume that your wage bill would be pretty high. That is a cost that is somewhat fixed for the near term future, perhaps one or two years. Now, if we assume that in one year you don't make it to the Champions League and finish outside of the top four, then your revenues may be severely impacted. This situation presents a real dilemma. Do you get rid of a bunch of players in a bid to cut the wage bill, even though they are of good quality and may just be going through a rough patch? Or do you keep the bulk of the playing squad and fund the transition period of reduced revenues with debt or equity injections? A lot of clubs have chosen to fund this gap with debt. And due to the fact we were in a low interest rate environment for a very long time, many clubs just kept increasing the debt on the balance sheet by either rolling, upsizing or refinancing it. This has been true for Leicester City, West Ham, Crystal Palace, Burnley, Everton and Man United in recent times. But then the real question is, how exactly do clubs manage to do this? So clubs typically borrow against the following items. 
broadcast income, player sale receipts, sponsorship income, ticketing income, and the stadium. Now, some of you wise guys are probably saying, what about acquisition financing, especially considering the whole Inter Milan debacle? At a high level, acquisition financing involves all of the above in some way. And this is because when a club is bought with acquisition financing, this means the buyer has borrowed using the assets of the club as collateral. And the acquired club will be tasked with repaying the debt, not the buyer of the club. This has been true for Man United, Bordeaux, Burnley and recently Inter Milan. With that being said, the topic of acquisition financing is not entirely suitable for this video as it only applies to a handful of clubs. But if you'd like to know more about it, then please let me know down in the comments below. While there, please smash the like button on this video and subscribe to the channel. Thank you. Going back to the types of financing typically raised by clubs, let's start with financing against broadcasting income. Clubs in the Premier League know that they'll learn a minimum of around £100 million in a season from their portion of broadcasting income. Because of this, they may want to borrow against the income with the view to repay the total sum within three to five years. Now, the amount of leverage a club can achieve really depends on the club in question. For a recently promoted side, it's possible to borrow up to £80 million on broadcasting income of £100 million. Oftentimes, these deals are structured such that if a club remains in the Premier League after one season with the loan, it won't amortise. Instead, the first repayment will roll for another year. However, if a club is relegated, there will be an accelerated amortisation such that the debt would be repaid in a short period of time. Usually, this is in line with a club's parachute payments. Now, since we're on the topic of relegation, there's another loan product football clubs in England in particular like to take out. It's referred to as a relegation facility. This is a loan product that banks and debt funds offer to football clubs. This essentially means that upon being relegated, a club can borrow against its parachute payments. A Premier League club knows upon relegation how much it will earn in broadcasting income for the next two to three years if it remains in the lower leagues of English football and as such may want to borrow using this income as collateral. Sheffield United did something like this a few years ago when they were relegated in the 2020-21 season. Now that you understand the concept of borrowing against broadcast income, let's discuss borrowing against player sell receipts. When a club sells a player, it typically does so on a buy now, pay later basis, as discussed in my other video here. As a result, trade receivables are born. So, for example, if Everton sells a player to Man United for £80 million and the player's contract is four years, then a fee will typically be paid as follows. £20 million on signing, £20 million in Season 2, £20 million in Season 3 and £20 million in Season 4. However, as only £20 million is paid on Day 1, Everton may still want the rest of the transfer fee today. In this case, Everton could take out a loan and use the remaining income of £60 million due to it from Man United as collateral. Practically, this could be a loan of let's say £55 million and £5 million would be used for fees and interest costs. So the price Everton would pay to get all of its money today is £5 million. Now that you understand the concept of borrowing against broadcasting income and player sell receipts, let's discuss borrowing against commercial income. Commercial contracts tend to have a lot of clauses, which means that the amounts clubs could receive vary significantly based on its performance. If a club is relegated, brands will typically pay less due to reduced brand exposure. Conversely, if a club wins the league and or is playing in the Champions League, brands will tend to pay more. Clubs can borrow against this income in the same way they borrow against broadcasting and player sale receipts. But they tend not to because of the volatility in this revenue line item and in many cases it's not a sizable amount. For example, Burnley will have a hard time raising 80 million in debt based on sponsorship income, but the club could easily raise 80 million in debt based on broadcasting income. Now, moving on to loans secured against matchday income, Practically, this is the easiest one to understand. If a club expects to sell £20 million in tickets for a given season, it may look to borrow against this income before the season and then use the receipts from matchday income to repay the loan. These financings tend to be very short term, i.e. on a one-year basis. 
Before moving on, let's briefly touch on stadium financing. Clubs also raise financing for stadiums, but there's a lot of caveats. Firstly, some clubs don't own their stadium. Secondly, if they do own the stadium, it's usually held in an entity which sits outside the club. So the debt will not sit at the club level, moreover, at a special purpose entity and then consolidated at the group level. This isn't always the case and some clubs reflect stadium borrowing on the balance sheet as seen with Juventus and Barcelona. If you'd like me to make a more detailed video on stadium financing, let me know down in the comments below, but I won't touch on it anymore here. Now, because of the guaranteed nature of media money and transfer receivables versus commercial or matchday income, lenders prefer lending to clubs based on media money and or player transfer receivables. In short, broadcasters will pay for games as long as there's a spectacle to show. And if one broadcaster falls away, as we've seen with the recent bidding process for the Premier League games, another will step in to take its place. This is not true in France though, as the global interest for Ligue 1 is diminishing. Perhaps it should be renamed from Ligue 1 to Ligue 1. Also, as clubs are afraid of sanctions by governing bodies, they tend to make their transfer payments on time. If a club fails to make transfer payments, it could be docked points, suspended and or fined. This sort of punishment deters clubs from missing transfer payments. Because of this, lenders like lending to clubs secured against transfer payments, understandably. On the other hand, commercial income comes with a lot of caveats, so it lacks that guaranteed characteristic lenders tend to look for. A matchday income is susceptible to a COVID-19 type of risk, meaning that there's a potential for games to be played in empty stadiums. Again, a situation that's not ideal for lenders. So as this video has shown so far, a club can leverage each revenue line item and clubs have definitely been guilty of overdoing it in recent years. And unfortunately, as we've seen, if clubs borrow too much, their debt burden will not allow them the operational flexibility they may need to run their businesses. In simple terms, when debt becomes unaffordable for a club, they may have to scale back significantly, which is what happened with Barcelona. Over the last decade, because of the financing options readily available to clubs with broadcast loan facilities, player receivable loans and trade credit offered by selling clubs, many clubs have decided to increase leverage. In addition to that, broadcasting income and player sale prices have both increased significantly over the last two decades. And to illustrate this, let's have a look at the Premier League's growth in broadcasting income and growth in player acquisition costs. Now, taking a step back, if a Modric type player existed in 2012, it's highly unlikely that he would fetch anywhere near 100 million on the transfer market. This type of nonsensical spending has been aided by increased trade credit offered by selling clubs, a generally inflated transfer market pushed upward by the fact clubs earn more so feel the pressure to spend more, and low interest rates and ready available credits. Admittedly, in recent transfer windows, clubs have retrenched from frivolous spending for fear of breaching financial regulations. Now going forward, if debts are coming up to maturity and clubs have to refinance, they're going to have to do so at rates much higher than they were previously used to. This could, and already has in some cases, started to present a real issue. So, if the top players in the market are burdened with debt and the relegation scrappers are also burdened with debt, doesn't this suggest that clubs are forever destined to be indebted? In short, and perhaps for most, yes. However, there are examples of clubs which manage to toe the line between performing well on the field and managing their debt and overall finances. Debt is not necessarily a bad thing if managed well and clubs are generating sufficient free cash flow to service debt and to reinvest in the club. The issue, however, as seen with Bordeaux, Inter, Burnley and Man United, is when debt servicing begins to take precedence over reinvesting in the club. But for things to really improve, there needs to be a closing of the gap in European football somehow. And this is because if the gap continues to widen between the super rich and those in the middle and lower tiers of European football, the reliance on debt from those in the lower classes will only increase in a bid to keep up with the Joneses. In any case, Please let me know what you think about this topic down in the comments below. As always, thank you for watching. If you liked the video, then please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.